Hi, Donald. 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 Hi, Donald.
And so as we begin, let's start by hearing from God's word. The psalmist writes this. He says, your word, Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Your faithfulness continues throughout all generations. Isn't that a precious reminder? And amongst all the change and the chaos that swirls around us, God's word remains the same. And he is and always will be faithful to his promises to the very end. And also a reminder that as we gather and, and sit under God's word today, we're not, we're not reading a dusty textbook. We're not, we're not reading an outdated set of rules and regulations. We're not studying an irrelevant old manuscript. No, no, no. We're, we're listening to and responding to the living, enduring, everlasting word of God as it points us to our saviour, the risen Lord Jesus. And so to that end, let's pray. As we begin now, let's, let's pray that God might open our eyes that we might behold wonderful things in his words. Let's do that now. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we do indeed ask that um, as we meet together online today, virtually, and as we, as we look forward with great anticipation to being able to meet physically in the coming weeks, we pray, please, that we would hold on to and remember the fact that though everything perhaps seems chaos around us, your word remains the same. Your word endures, is eternal. That your promises to us will never fail. That you are faithful. And so we ask today, as we come and as we sit under your word and as we, as we hear from it and hear it taught and as we sing and as we, as we pray, Father, please might you lift our eyes that we might see and behold wonderful things and be directed to Jesus the one in whom our hope is found. And we pray all this in Christ's wonderful name. Amen. We're going to continue in prayer by saying together the words of the Lord's Prayer. Those words that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. The words are going to be on the screen. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Let's sing. All creatures. All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thou burning sun with golden beam. Thou silver with softer gleam, oh praise him, oh praise him, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thou flowing water pure and clear. of evening find a voice oh praise him oh praise him hallelujah 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 and all you people lift your heart 
take your part, come singing, hallelujah, you who long pain and sorrow bear, praise God and on him cast your care, oh praise him, oh praise him, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let all things their Creator bless and worship Him in humbleness. Oh, praise Him. Hallelujah. Praise, praise the Father, praise the Son, and praise the Spirit, three in one. Oh, praise Him, oh, praise Him, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hi everyone, my name is Ian and I lead the Serve Ministry at Dundonald Church. The Serve Ministry is all about helping each of us, but particularly those who are new, to feel welcomed, connected and joined in with our family. Now we do that in various ways, but often the starting point for lots of that work is at our Sunday gatherings. After months of not meeting, wonderfully, we're back here at St Andrew's Wimbledon for our 6.30 face-to-face -face services on Sunday evenings. And as we heard from Richard, our senior pastor last week, we're excited to announce that we're heading back to Wimbledon Chase Primary School for our daytime services from early October. And the Serve team are really excited to welcome you back to church. We're busy working out how we can do that as safely and simply as possible. Despite not being able to meet as a family for what feels like a really long time, we have been able to gather together online and in God's mercy we've even made some new friends during this time. People who are now coming along to our face-to-face -face gatherings and beginning to join our Connect Bible Studies. There's lots to look forward to at Dundonald in the year ahead, not least that we have this amazing new building that we're looking forward to meeting in. So if you're watching this and have been joining us online since lockdown and beyond, on behalf of everyone at Dundonald, can I say a huge welcome and warmly invite you to join us here at church and start to get involved. Just a couple of very brief reminders from me. Um, firstly, about the parenting course. We mentioned it last week, if you, were, if you were here for that. And putting parenting to bed. We're starting this Thursday, 8 o'clock, uh, three evenings um, over the course of three weeks on Zoom. Um, just a reminder that this, um, these three evenings are best suited probably to those with younger kids. So um, particularly uh, if you've got kids aged 0 through 7, uh, it's probably best designed for them but, but accessible to everybody um, and these evenings are designed to be a really easy invite for friends and guests who might otherwise not be connected to church um, so can I encourage you uh, if you're a regular at Dundonald to, um, and you've got kids at that age bracket why don't invite a friend along um, to those evenings putting parenting to bed uh, book a space dundonald.org slash parenting for this Thursday that's the first thing second thing just a reminder that we're planning on going kind of COVID safe door knocking on Saturday 10th of October on the doors of the Apostle Street, so those roads opposite um, our new building, and just to say a cheery hello and give them an opportunity to chat a bit about the building, um, that sort of thing. What a great chance to just check in with those people who are neighbours to our church building um, and to see how they're doing in this strange season. We haven't been able to do that for quite a number of months. And we're going to do that, as I say, in a COVID secure way. Just come along for half an hour or so. We're going to be just outside the new building, um, uh, giving people a place to, to go and, and, and knock and say hello to people. We'd love to see you uh, for at least some of that on Saturday, the 10th of October. And come anytime between 9.30 and 1pm. That's all. Thanks. We're going to spend some time talking to our Heavenly Father in prayer now. Let's bow our heads and pray. We say with the psalmist of Psalm 113, Praise the Lord. 
Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Heavenly Father, thank you for your sovereign care and reign, for the sun that rises every day, for the rain that falls and the seasons that change. You are in charge of all creation and we praise you for it and your goodness, especially when we think about the love you poured out to us by sending your Son, our Lord Jesus, to take the punishment for our sin and to reconcile us to you. And now we can have peace with our Creator God. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters at St. Peter's Fulham. Thank you that they can gather physically despite restrictions. Thank you for their growth groups starting with the biggest membership yet. And we ask, Lord, that as they listen through 1 Peter during their sermons, that you will deepen their love for you and equip them spiritually as exiles in Fulham. Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth? Lord, we pray for Pastor Mazin at the Jerusalem Alliance Church. We ask that you protect him and his church as Israel goes into a second full lockdown. Thank you that the church is becoming familiar with online services and using Zoom. And we pray, Lord, that they will stay engaged as they can't meet physically. And we pray for those that are watching online, that they will seek to find out more about the gospel and how it is changing lives in Israel. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. Lord, we pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Eritrea. Thank you for the 27 Christians who were jailed for being Christians. Thank you that they've been released on bail. Lord, we pray for your ongoing protection of them as most of them have been sent back to national service, which is compulsory with an indefinite duration in inhumane conditions. Please, Lord, bring change in Eritrea so that Christianity and following Jesus will be recognized as an official religion. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us into your family, that we are part of the body of Christ, which you have gathered here at Don Donald. I pray for those who are struggling with various reasons due to the coronavirus pandemic. Some have lost loved ones. Please comfort them. Some are very ill. We pray for your healing. And some are unsure of the future, financially or mentally, or physically. Please give peace and wisdom. May you be glorified through your church during this pandemic and beyond. Lord, we thank you for your word, the Bible. Please open our hearts to hear what you want to speak to us through your spirit and to grow to love you and our brothers and sisters in Christ more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our Bible reading today is from the book of John, chapter 17, from verses 1 through 5. I'll give you a few moments to find this passage within your own Bibles. After Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. 
I think one of the hardest things about the COVID-19 lockdown and these wretched restrictions is not being able to get out and away on holiday to behold God's glory in the beauty of nature. And I think one reason that staying indoors is so demoralizing, despite having everything that we need, is because we are created for beholding God's glory. Glory means splendor. When the Bible speaks of God's glory, it often speaks of the, the weightiness of his splendor. However hard atheists try to persuade us that God isn't really there, and however much our rebellious hearts want to suppress the knowledge of God so that we can do what we want without feeling bad about it, we all still enjoy beholding a few rays of God's glory in stunning scenery of the natural world. Most extremely, perhaps, in watching the Niagara Falls or gazing out of the, over the Grand Canyon, that feeling of being incredibly small and looking at greatness. But also, of course, we have it when we feel punched in the stomach by the beauty of someone we love, or perhaps by the serenity of a sleeping baby. Psalm 8 proclaims, the heavens declare the glory of God. Because that's right, isn't it? The, the shining of the sun by day and of the stars by night display something majestic of the weightiness of the glory of God. Isaiah chapter 6 says, the whole earth is full of his glory. Because however much the world has been spoiled by human beings, we were created to worship God and to enjoy his glory. And everywhere in nature, we see little signs, rays of the splendor of God. And we feel, feel profoundly demotivated if all we can do is watch Netflix on a TV screen. But the wonderful news proclaimed by the Apostle John in his gospel is that more clearly than we see the glory of God in all the wonders of the natural world, in what's often called the general revelation of God. Most wonderfully, he says, we have seen his glory. Chapter 1, verse 14. The Gospels in the New Testament all proclaim that the glory of God has been revealed to our world when God the Son took flesh in Jesus. The Apostle John, who spent three years traveling with Jesus as an eyewitness of his earthly ministry, breathlessly explains in the introduction to his gospel, verse 14, chapter 1, verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. He says we've seen his glory. His glory, that is the weight of God's splendor, was revealed in Jesus in his character full of gracious kindness and truthful integrity. John recounts Jesus revealing his glory in countless miraculous signs. But supremely, his glory is revealed in his death and resurrection. The glory of God, that is the jaw-dropping weight of divine splendor, so heavy it makes you stagger in amazement. It stops you talking as in your soul you think, wow was increasingly revealed in Jesus and ultimately in his death and resurrection. Now here in John chapter 17, we get to the point where Jesus has been preparing his disciples for his departure by teaching them at their famous last supper together. He's been telling them about his fivefold promise of the spirit of truth, coming to continue his work as their advisor. All that is in chapters 13 to 16. And now as their conversation draws to a close, in this majestic and beautiful prayer of chapter 17, just now hours before the agony and then triumph of his crucifixion and resurrection, with the described in the crescendo of chapters 18 to 21, we are privileged to hear God the Son praying to God the Father before his impending ordeal. Surely we should listen to these words with reverent and respectful hearts. This is a great moment in the history of the world as the Son praised the Father before his death. 
rehearsing many of the themes that we've heard from Jesus throughout John's gospel, Jesus asks God the Father to glorify him in 17, 1 to 5, then to protect his disciples in 17, 6 to 19, and then to unite his people, verses 20 to 26. We'll look at each of these passages in turn. It's astonishing that this prayer contains no self-pitying complaints about the degradation and pain that he knows he will shortly be engulfed by. It's all about glorifying his Father in heaven. So this week, we're just going to focus on the first five verses on the epic opening request to be glorified, which is supported by five short but extraordinary statements. His essential prayer, which comes in verse one, is this. Jesus prayed, Father, glorify your son. Look with me at verse one. After Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son. Once again, we are allowed to hear the loving intimacy within the loving, the living God, who is a trinity of God, the father, God, the son and God, the Holy Spirit. And here the son praised his father, father, the hour has come. In other words, the appointed time for which so long we heard him say, not yet. The time is not yet. The hour is not yet. But then we know from chapters 12 to 13 that this hour is now upon him. This is the hour for him to be glorified. The hour for which he was sent from heaven. The hour for the judgment of our sin. The hour for Satan's power to be broken. The hour for him to, to depart this world in victory and the hour for his father to be glorified. The hour, the time is for his death and exaltation. And so the son asks the father to do what has been planned from before the creation of the world, namely glorify your son. So if glory means weight of splendor, to glorify somebody means to acknowledge them as worthy of splendor and to bestow splendor upon them. Like you might bow before a king and then crown the king. Or when the Barcelona football crowd bow before Lionel Messi, you know how the crowds all, all bow in worship and then they sing his name. They are both recognizing his glory and also bestowing glory upon him as the greatest football player in the world ever. The utterly astonishing thing here is that Jesus is describing the hour of his death on a Roman cross. He's asking his father to glorify himself, to bestow glory upon him as he dies in humiliating degradation, as the crowds are not singing his name, but mocking abuse. And as he suffers agonizing pain with a crown of thorns on his head. Here is the time when Jesus is asking the father to glorify him. Jesus knew from the suffering servant songs of the prophet Isaiah, that when he will be lifted up to die on a hideous cross in the place of sinners like us, he will be glorified just as much as when he's lifted up in resurrection and ascension to be enthroned in heaven. Indeed, Drenched in blood, gasping for breath, his death will be his finest hour. Forget the Grand Canyon. When you look at Jesus dying on the cross, you see the glory of God in technicolor. Here we see the glory of God's loving nature most clearly. Here we see the glory of his love vividly displayed in costly self-sacrifice. But Jesus' desire to be glorified was never selfish. His reason for asking to be glorified, notice, is so I can glorify you. See what he says here, that your son may glorify you. Jesus knows that when he offers himself to die for our sins, to satisfy the requirements of God's justice so that we can be forgiven and saved, not only is Jesus glorified for what he has accomplished, but the father is glorified for what he has planned. Let me illustrate. Uh, you probably know that Liverpool eventually won the Premier League uh, earlier this year. But it was not just the great football players like Salah and uh, Mane and Alexander-Arnold who were glorified 
in that campaign, but their coach, Jurgen Klopp, who never kicked a ball, but masterminded the whole campaign, who was also glorified. Jurgen was glorified by the campaign as much as the players. You can imagine the players saying to one another in their final match, when they secured the title, saying to one another, now let's win this one for Jurgen. They wanted to win, but especially they wanted to win for the coach who has given them so much. He's a magnificent coach and they want to glorify him. How much more would you want to do it if the coach was your own father? You see, Jesus wants to be glorified, but above all, to glorify his Father in heaven, who has masterminded the whole plan for our salvation. So he prays, glorify me, that I can bring glory to you. Now Jesus recalls the plan, sometimes called the covenant between the Father and the Son, made before even the creation of the world. He says, Glorify me so I can glorify you, for you gave me authority to give eternal life to my people. Look at verse 2. For you granted him, speaking of himself, authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Jesus is speaking about the authority, his authority, of all the people of this world, granted to Jesus before creation, and about to be established by his death, resurrection, and ascension to the throne of heaven. This authority was given to Jesus to call many sinners chosen by the Father for Jesus, to come as his people, to be loved as his bride, to share eternal life with him, enjoying his kindness forever. The Father's plan was always to glorify the Son by giving him a vast multinational people who have benefited from his grace and love to enjoy, worship and glorify him forever. That was the plan, to glorify his son. And he's about to make certain of it by dying for them. Jesus is reminding his father of the task that he was given because he's about to ask to come home. So trying to illustrate this, I suppose it's, it's a bit like a registrar doctor reminding the senior consultant of the treatments they'd agreed for all the patients on the ward, because now he's carried out the treatments, he's done what was agreed, he's fulfilled his task, he'd really like to go home now. That's how it is for Jesus. Jesus has accomplished the task they agreed he would accomplish, and now he wants to come home. How wonderful to hear how Jesus describes his ministry on this earth. He didn't come to condemn or to destroy us. He didn't come merely to instruct or inspire us. He didn't come merely to give us some grace through the sacraments of the church so we could try a bit harder to save ourselves, which is a doomed project, if ever there was one. He came to give the gift of eternal life to millions of people like us who don't deserve anything from God after the way we've treated him. He was sent to give life to everyone who's been given to him by the Father, those whom God has chosen from amongst the sinners of the world. And how wonderful is this gift? If you've received the gift of life from Jesus, what a great privilege and joy this is. We don't deserve it. What a precious gift we have. Because look at how good is this life. He says next, eternal life is knowing you through Christ. Look at verse 3. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life, you see, is a phrase that should be more tra accurately translated as the life of the world to come. In other words, eternal life is not just this life going on forever, which would be a profound disappointment for many of us, but rather the quality of life enjoyed in heaven. Eternal life is the life of heaven, which D Jesus describes as knowing the one true God through Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus was sent to be known by the disciples and now to be revealed to us in the Bible, not just so we can know about God, but that so through Jesus we can actually know God ourselves personally, to have a personal relationship with the living God in Jesus. 
to trust him, to worship him, to delight him, to enjoy him, to glorify him forever. Life in all its fullness, which begins from the moment we turn to Christ, is not just everlasting, but ever more exciting. Because the more we know God, not only do we begin to grasp what's going on in the world, which is so confusing, we start to understand our small part in the great drama starring Jesus called history, but we find profound satisfaction, like gazing into the Grand Canyon or being captivated by the Niagara Falls. We get to enjoy the jaw-dropping glory of God in Jesus for ourselves, which is what we were created to do. That's why reading, reading about Jesus, getting to know God in Jesus in the Bible, is the most profoundly satisfying human experience there is. The great recently deceased theologian J.I. Packer called his greatest book, summarizing the privileges of being a Christian, Knowing God, because knowing God summarizes the privilege of the Christian life. Indeed, our evening congregation small groups are still called Knowing God Groups because when we launched them many years ago, we studied a chapter of the Knowing God book each week. So if you haven't read it, perhaps I could recommend that you read Knowing God or take it on holiday, read it slowly, or listen to it if you can get a recording online, as it really is a modern classic. In fact, if you had to read one book only in addition to the Bible, I reckon most Bible teachers would say, Read Knowing God. It's an absolutely brilliant book, top of any good recommended reading list. So, Knowing God, that is the joy, that is the privilege of eternal life. So now Jesus returns to launch his request. He says next in verse 4, I've glorified you by finishing my work of making you known. Verse 4, he says, I've brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. Now, the work he's finished doesn't exclude, but includes his imminent death, resurrection and ascension. For he's speaking of how he has glorified his father on earth which clearly includes the hour that is now upon him, his death and resurrection. He's saying he's now about to finish his work. His work has been to reveal the Father in the world and to clothe the Father in splendor, to glorify his Father in the eyes of the world as we marvel at the Father's character revealed in Jesus, in his beautiful character, his wise teaching and his loving heart. The heart of the Father, all revealed in the Son. You see, what Jesus has accomplished is not only the forgiveness of our sins, but the revelation of God for us all. I suppose it's a bit like a builder showing the architect how he has made the glorious plans into a glorious reality. See, Jesus is asking the Father to recognize that his mission is accomplished. He has now put into reality the great plans of the Father, saying, Father, I've done what you've asked me to do. I've built what you planned. I've made you known to the world. And this is the basis of his request for glory. Glory not only to be lifted up on a cross, which he's already asked for in verse 1, but now finally in verse 5, now, Father, glorify me again in your presence. Do you see, look at verse 5. And now, Father, glorify me, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. When God the Son took flesh, he never abandoned any of his divinity, but he did surrender his glory. He left the glory of heaven, where he was properly worshipped and loved and adored and glorified. And he became a man, flesh. He was appallingly treated on earth. He was born into a poor tradesman's family. As soon as he was born, the local King Herod tried to kill him. And so the family had to flee as refugees to Egypt. Then they returned to live in a poverty-stricken backwater called Nazareth. When he finally launched his public ministry, he was homeless and harassed by the authorities until he was eventually arrested and unjustly condemned to horrific beatings 
and an agonizing crucifixion while he was mocked and scorned as a common criminal until he was dead and buried in a borrowed tomb. I mean, what an appalling way to treat the glorious King of Heaven. And now in this amazing sacrificial love, he is to be glorified. So Jesus prays, Father, after this is over, bring me home. Bring me home in my resurrected human body, because now he has a human body, to enjoy the glory I used to have when I was with you in heaven. And so now you see he's in the glory that we meet elsewhere in the Bible. For example, in Revelation chapter 1, just listen to this description of Jesus as he now is. So the Jesus who walked in Galilee, who was crucified just outside Jerusalem, this is now how the risen Jesus is. The living human Jesus is like this. John writes in Revelation chapter 1, someone like a son of man. That is, the resurrected man enthroned on high is Jesus. Dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. In other words, he holds the office of the mediating royal high priest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, depicting the scholar with ancient wisdom. His eyes were like blazing fire, with holy, piercing insight. His feet were like bronze, glowing in a furnace, like a warrior in complete conquest. His voice was like the sound of rushing waters, a thunderous waterfall with absolute authority. In his right hand, he held seven stars, keeping his churches safe in his mighty grip. Out of his mouth came a sharp, double-edged sword, like a judge issuing death penalties. His faith was like, face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance, dazzling with the weighty splendor of his glory. And John writes, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. He just collapsed in front of the glory of God in Jesus. Then he, Jesus, placed his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And behold, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. That's Jesus as he is now, reigning in glory. So if you're feeling a bit demotivated by lockdown and all these wretched restrictions, if you want to behold the captivating, jaw-dropping, weighty splendor of the glory of the living God, as you and I were created to do, if you long to see something marvelous, if you want to see something that will take your breath away, if you want to see something that will make you go, wow, I feel the wondrousness of the glory of God and find grace and strength to keep going through dark days, even from your living room, you need to gaze upon the sun. First in his death, described in John 18 to 20, as he is crucified. Why not read ahead in these chapters? We'll get to them soon. Why not read ahead and marvel at the weighty splendor of God revealed in Jesus' loving self-sacrifice? And then also, as he now is in glory, read Revelation chapter 1 at the end of the Bible. If you want to see Jesus as he is now, to see him in all his weighty splendor, displaying the glory of God for us all to see. Look at him in Revelation 1. In other words, if you want the fullness of eternal life in knowing God forever, yourself, personally, turn to believe in the Son who has revealed the Father to us. Let's pray, shall we? Lord Jesus Christ, now risen and reigning in glory, in the weighty splendor of your greatness. We do want to worship you and adore you. We want to recognize your worth and ascribe glory to you. Thank you that you came into this world to make the glory of the Father known to us, 
Thank you that as he wanted to glorify you, you have glorified him. And thank you that we see your glory most clearly in your loving self-sacrifice on the cross, as well as in your resurrection and ascension to power and glory on high. Lord Jesus, you are glorious. And we know that when we gaze upon you, we find fulfillment and satisfaction for which we were created to behold your glory, to worship you, to know how small we are in front of you, and yet to know that we are loved by you and treasured and protected by you. Lord Jesus Christ, we praise you that you have been glorified. We pray you'd help us to glorify you in the coming week, in the way we live our lives, in the way we ascribe and recognize your glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. There is no other name in heaven can be found through whom we are redeemed, through whom your grace abounds. No other name can save but Jesus Christ our Lord. There is no other sorrows, tears, my strength to cast out fears, no other name but Jesus, Jesus, my hope in darkest nights, my hope in soul's delight, no other name but Jesus, Jesus. No other cure for sin, but that our Savior died. No other hope we have, but that He rose again. He rose again. My joy in sorrow's tears, my strength to cast out fears. No other name but Jesus, Jesus. My hope in darkest nights, my broken soul's delight. No other name but Jesus, Jesus. throne endures, no other song remains, but worthy is the Lamb, who was for sinners slain, when every knee shall bow, and tongue confess you are Lord, you are Lord. sorrow's teeth, my strength to cast out fears, no other name but Jesus, Jesus, my hope in darkest night, my broken soul's delight, no other name but Jesus, Jesus.
Hey, thanks so much for joining us for church today. Don't forget, uh, next week we're going to be live from Wimbledon Chase School in the daytime and St. Andrews in the evening. Keep an eye out on your emails this week, just letting you know um, if you're a Dundonald regular when your dates for attending are. Um, check the website for all the info that you need uh, in terms of the plans for resuming getting back together. If you've got any questions, as always, um, info at dundonald.org. Someone will get back to you um, uh, very quickly um, with regards to any questions you might have about Sunday gatherings. I can't wait to see you all soon. Let's finish with some words from Hebrews. And now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.